good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Jenk Center. And I want to thank the Cummings Foundation and the Winchester Senior Association for making this event possible. So uh, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat function and we'll address them at the end of the program. And please stay muted. Um, also, you receive an online survey, so we appreciate you filling that out. So in August, I'm going to have a virtual program with the Guggenheim. They're going to do highlights, a, a virtual tour with us. It's a, it's a private tour. It will be on August 2nd at 6.30, probably around about an hour. We're going to have an in-person concert with Maddie Heckler. Um, that will be on the 9th at 7.00. Then we have, excuse me, a virtual composers corner with guest Rich Sokolo. Sokolo, I hope I said that correctly. And that's uh, on the 23rd at 7 p.m. And then we have an in-person um, with Debbie Block. She's gonna present Audrey Hepburn. I believe that Irina Gelman's gonna be there to play the piano as well and do all the music from Audrey's movies. And so in July, we have on the 16th, um, Amelia Earhart, though I believe um, at this time it is full. We have Dancers Dialogue with guest Sally Slagle, and that's going to be with our host, Pam Weiss, and that's on the 19th. We have uh, in-person concert with Diane Therese. She's going to do the Horseless Carriage Musical event with us at 7. And then we have an in-person Winchester Culture uh, District and Winchester Winchester Council working together to support the arts of Winchester. And that will be at seven o'clock on the 26th. So if you'd like to sign up for any of the, the events, you can go to our website and register for these and everything is free. So that brings us to this evening. We have Composers Corner with guest Ken Field and of course, um, my amazing husband and host, Andrew Solentano. So Kenfield is a composer, a saxophonist, a flautist, and a percussionist. He has received international public and critical acclaim for his solo work, his work with the Revolutionary Snake Ensemble, which he leads, Bird Songs of the Mosaic, Willie Loco Alexander's Persistence of Memory Orchestra, and the Armenian American Jazz Project, I hope I'm saying this right, Musiner, Musiner as well as his commissioned compositions and performances with Bridgman Packer Dance. And Field has composed a number of pieces for the children's television program, Sesame Street. He was named a 2017 finalist in music composition by the Massachusetts Cultural Council and currently serves on the organizing committee of Honk Festival and as the president of the board of directors of Jazz Boston and vice president of the board of directors of Tutoring Plus of Cambridge. Uh, Ken Field hosts the New Edge, a weekly radio program of creative instrumental music currently airing on WMBR, WOMR, and Taint Radio. So um, <clears throat> I am going to turn this over, excuse me, to uh, both of them, and we're going to enjoy a wonderful evening. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Hillary. And thank you, Ken. You know, Ken actually is a good friend of Eric Lindgren from the Bird Songs of the Mesozoic. And um, I was uh, quite pleased when, when um, you know, Eric suggested, you really gotta get in touch with this guy because he's amazing. And uh, I ended up uh, luckily connecting with him and then just spending the last couple of weeks listening to his music. And it's just a lot of fun. I'm sure you guys will have a great time tonight. And um, so, so welcome, Ken, thank you for joining us. And uh, maybe just start by giving us a little bit of your background in terms of you know how music became a part of your life. Did you come from a musical family? You know, what were you know, what was that seminal moment when you said, I want to be a musician when I grow up? Just love to hear a little bit of that background story. Yeah, I, I decided that I wanted to be a musician when I grew up. Uh, I think it was yesterday or maybe the day before. Uh, <laughs> uh, eventually, I'm going to grow up. I think that that'll be a, <laughs> that'll be a good thing to look forward to. Uh, I, well, I, I got started playing the clarinet when I was 10 uh, by my parents who thought that that would be a good thing for me and my siblings to to learn an instrument. But I will say my my father was not a musician, not musically inclined, didn't really listen to music. My mom had uh, 
uh, done some music when she was younger. She had played in a mandolin orchestra in, uh, in New York City, where she grew up. Uh, and, um, but music was not something that they considered to be, uh, uh, you know, as, as many parents think, that music is not a career, uh, a viable career. And so I, uh, I played clarinet from age 10 on through high school. I was pretty good. I practiced. I was kind of compulsive about practicing yeah. um, and played in some of the regional, uh, you know, the all uh, the local all shore in New Jersey, all shore band and the all state band and uh, got to uh, college. And I proceeded to break my front tooth by running into a door. Ah. Uh, tooth first, uh, which kind of put a little crimp in my clarinet playing, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. Yeah. And I, uh, no embouchure, right? <laughs> yeah, it really wasn't a good thing for clarinetists to do, mm -hmm. uh, in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Um, but I then took up the flute, you know, that you can play flute without any teeth, right? And I'm really? planning, I'm planning I on it when, <laughs> I, when I get older and lose my teeth. In fact, I have a little. Uh, I have a little image, a little drawing of me at, you know, age, whatever, 80, 90, um, with no teeth. I, I, I would love to see that sometime. You'll yeah. have to show that to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I eventually took up, uh, I, I fell in with some people in, uh, I went to school in Providence, fell in with some people who were doing some interesting music, some Frank Zappa, some uh, 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 John Coltrane, uh, mm. McCoy Tyner, uh, you know, just really out, uh, Captain Beefheart, some interesting stuff. And they yeah. taught me a lot about um, improvisational music. I, I really didn't have any sense of improvising when I was growing up, mm. uh, even in high school. And uh, there was no no sense of a stage band or jazz program at that point in my mm -hmm. life. And so I uh, I started when I, in college, when I started playing flute, I started jamming with blues musicians and... Uh, just sort of learning by ear, picking up how you pick out notes that work, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I did that for a while, started playing with these people, and then eventually uh, picked up a saxophone. Uh, the saxophone, as it turns out, the embouchure is a little different, so it uh, it works better with a, a, a fake the fake tooth I now have in front, uh, uh -huh. front uh, top tooth. Um, so would you recommend you should break a tooth and replace it with a fake tooth that's good for sax players? That's like a, a good technique there? <laughs> well, it worked for me, you know, you what can I say? Everybody's All different. Right. But, uh, maybe boxers have another career after their Yeah, career. yeah, it might, you know, maybe. Um, so I, I eventually, I, start, I studied computer science in college and uh, started working in the computer industry. I worked for some very interesting companies, uh, took some time off, went to Berkeley, uh, college music. Uh, in between two different computer uh, positions and uh, learned a, an awful lot. Oh, yeah. I studied with Joe Viola, the uh, really famed alt, uh, saxophone instructor at Berkeley, mm. uh, the late Joe Viola, who uh, really made a huge difference in my life and uh, learned enough at Berkeley to, uh, to sort of function in a variety of musical situations not necessarily shine, but function and not embarrass myself. <laughs> and that gave me the uh, ability to jump into different kinds of situations and learn on the job, uh, which great. I've been doing and continue to do. So you weren't a full-time musician at one point, you were working in the, in the computer field. But So what was it that finally said, you know, made you think I, I should dedicate my whole life to music? How did that was there like a moment where that took place or just kind yeah, of- Yeah, there was a moment that took place because they asked me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's that one door closes, another opens. Yeah, so break your your, your front tooth oh. and then get fired. You know, I didn't really get fired. I, I ended up in a very nice position at a yeah. uh, a company called Bolt, Baranek & Newman, BBN. Oh, of in, course, uh, yeah. Fresh Pond in Cambridge. Yeah, uh, yeah. Amazing company. They, they were involved in the early internet uh, development. Uh, I was working doing speech processing, digital speech processing, oh, wow. doing programming real-time systems for uh, speech recognition, speech synthesis, mm -hmm. uh, and bitrate compression systems. Very interesting work, very heady. Yeah. Um, I did that for a while, then I, I moved on to some other things, to computing resource management at the company. Um, but I ended up uh, being able to work part-time there. Uh, through a variety of circumstances that maybe uh, we don't have time to get into, but yeah, uh, yeah. 
and I had a I had a staff under me all working full time and I was working part time. I got a new boss who didn't really like that I was part time. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a very relaxed place for a while, but then it kind of transitioned to more of a formal situation. And he didn't like that. He uh, uh, offered me the opportunity to go full time. I didn't really want to at that point. I was uh, right. very happy with what I was doing and playing music part time and, and working. Yeah. So it sounds like a wonderful transition, kind of a transition yeah. here. Because you were working part time, you're able to do the music and that just took over. and. Yeah, but he he uh, he wanted me to go full time, and and then said if I didn't want to go full time, I, yeah. I mean I I actually found some other opportunities at the company to stay part time, but I, I realized he was willing to lay me off, which meant yeah. I got a little severance package, yeah. and uh, and if I were to leave as a result of his insistence, I go full time. So I I took that, and yeah. uh, and I, it was a risk. It was a big risk because who knows? Uh, but it all worked out very well. I'm very That's awesome. I was very lucky. You know, you know I, I worked at IBM and uh, they gave me a severance package that was amazing. Mm -hmm. Actually, I didn't qualify for it, but I wanted to take it. So it was so amazing. My son was two. I thought I'd spend some time with him. And I, I tried to write music for a year and make a profession out of it. It's hard to do in one year. Yeah. And uh, I actually had this concept for the, a new Tonight Show theme song, but I could never get Jay Lono's manager to listen to it. And so I yeah. got a lot of great experience out of it, but I didn't get it very far. <laughs> so <laughs> years later, well, I met him. And I played it for him. He said, that's a great tune. But I had nothing to do with the music. So sorry. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. But, wow. uh, but you wow. made it. You, you, you made a transition and really went through. That's awesome. So, um, so well, I, was very, I was very fortunate. And uh, I'm you know, grateful to people like Eric Lindgren, who is here today for, uh, you know, for letting me join uh, Bird Songs of the Mesozoic yeah. uh, and you know, other things that I've had the opportunity to do. So. Now, you know, it's interesting. Your career was very intellectual, and I think of jazz as being a very intellectual thing. I mean, I, Joe Mulholland recently was showing me a, a riff he was playing on top of just a simple C7 chord that blew me away. It had every other note in the galaxy in it, and it just he was up and down on the piano, and it, oh my God, it just like my head almost exploded watching him. So, I mean, I, when I think of jazz, I think it's probably one of the most intellectual music, uh, you know, genres out there. So, so well, you know, a, I, I will I will respond to that by saying that uh, yeah. There's a lot of uh, theory and there's a lot of, uh, but there's a lot of jazz musicians who, who just do it by ear and by gut. And, yeah. and that is also a part of jazz. And, and if you're playing jazz from a purely intellectual perspective, uh, you, you might want to reconsider because uh, there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of uh, uh, gut that goes into uh, playing any kind of music, uh, you know, yeah. but jazz yeah. as well. And I, I would say that, um, you know, one of the advice, uh, a piece of advice that, that I've heard, uh, you know, lots of jazz musicians give, I, I forget who, um, that you learn all the stuff and then you forget it and you just play. And so yeah. That's, yeah. that's the idea. Excellent. Well, I apologize in advance. I'm actually at work still. And uh, I was in an operating room all afternoon on a medical device and, and uh I cannot get into the Ethernet directly because it's, we do government work and I'm on a personal computer, which I didn't realize. So we're doing Wi-Fi. So hopefully this will all work. But but let me first uh, share the screen and get. We, we have, this is some, there's so many things we could share and, and and review tonight. But you know, Ken and I tried to figure out what are what are the uh, what are the ones that are probably the most seminal you know to talk about tonight. So I thought I'd start. Is it okay with you if I start with the uh, the dance one first? Is that okay? The Bridgman did, dance, Packer dance, or did you want to start with uh, uh, "Got It" by by Ken Field? What would you like to do? Uh, you know, it, it's all good. Uh, I I'm happy if you start with "I Got It," or if you want to start with uh, "Under the Skin," that's fine. That's all. Yeah, let's do Bridgman. I just love. It. By the way, I don't know if you want to talk about anything beforehand, but the, sure. the visuals are amazing because they seem to overlay, and I don't know how they did it, but it was it's just as amazing as the music. The two together well, work out really well. I will I will say something about this. So I had this great opportunity to work with Bridgman Packer Dance. It's a dance duo. They're actually a, a married couple. And they, they work with uh, projections of themselves. And they're very creative. They started out by working with shadows, but then they started working with video projections uh, of themselves. So it was like kind of layered. Wow. Uh, There's uh, only dancers. two people in this thing? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I did not catch that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm really so, going to enjoy this now. <laughs> so I, I actually, you know, through a whole series of uh, circumstances, I met them at a a, a meeting a conference of the National Performance Network, and someone named Jefferson James uh, introduced me and said you should meet these people. And she, so she introduced me to uh, uh, Myrna Packer, 
And uh, I gave Myrna Packer a CD of mine, uh, uh, the CD Pictures of Motion, in which I had layered myself. And uh, never heard from them for, uh, you know, like a year. And a year later, I get a call. And they're like, we're about to go off on a tour to, I forget where they were going to Europe or something, but we're putting in a proposal for our next project and we'd like to uh, incorporate your music. And I'm like, wow, that's great. And so I I, what I realized is what they do vid- in video, I do in music. So that's yes. what it's all about. Oh my God. Well, here goes some of it. I didn't realize it was just two people. That's I guess I should have paid more attention. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is and that, that actually was a piece called, uh, I think it's called uh, Slots or Slits in the Curtain. It has yeah. two different names. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, and that was done with uh, layering the saxophone. And they, they toured widely uh, in Europe and in uh, Mexico. And uh, and they brought me along and I played one of the parts and the others were pre-recorded. I usually don't like playing with pre-recorded parts, but this actually worked really well. So yeah. So uh, now, when you worked with them, did you did they first show you some of the dance, or no. was it the opposite, where they said write the music and we'll figure out the choreography to it, or was it a little yeah, fun? yeah, it was <laughs> good. That's a great question because uh, you know I would have loved if they had showed me the dance and then I wrote the music. That yeah. that would you know give me a little structure, give me a little sense of what what to do. But they didn't. They said we're going to do this kind of in parallel and you write some music then we'll try to do some dance and then we'll you know go back and forth and they were in new york i was in boston so you know <laughs> it was a uh, a little challenging but um uh we talked a lot uh, they, you know they gave me some tempos the, some concepts i said give me you know five words that describe what you're trying to get across mm-hmm. uh and uh, uh so you know we ended up with a lot of back and forth and uh, uh eventually came up with some of that material um, That's cool. Now you say, give me five words. You happen to remember what those words were? No, I have no idea. Okay, yeah. I wrote them down. That's an but, interesting yeah, concept. Know, is that something you do often, where you say, well, you know, you describe it in yeah. words, and then and then I'll yeah. come up with it. So yeah, when when I'm concept. when I'm writing, uh, you know, I've been asked uh, not a lot, but sometimes to write uh, soundtrack music for a film or for yeah. you know, my late wife Karen uh, uh, Karen Aqua uh, her animation. And, mm. you know, describing what, what you what somebody wants in music, in words, is hard. I mean, how do yeah. you describe what you want in music without singing the music or whatever? You know, music is its own thing. Words are their own thing. And words sure. don't necessarily describe, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a, an unambiguous way, what yeah. somebody has in their head in terms of the music, right? I mean, so I'm thinking so, the words that come to mind might be upbeat, fun, syncopated yeah. for this one. Yeah. Piece whatever, so, yeah. so I asked for a few words, a few phrases, you know, and that, you know, it's not definitive. It's not yeah. unambiguous, but it's helpful to have somebody say, these are some things, some words that come to mind when I think of the music that I want for this. Because usually okay. when people are, are doing a dance or doing film, they're, they're hearing some kind of music in their head. Uh-huh. But how they com- communicate that to you, you know, it's kind of impossible. So, yeah. That's great. 
How about this? Got it. I know we wanted to start with that originally, and, and this is a nice uh, upbeat thing too, I believe. Yeah, what did you I got to it. Say something about this? Yeah, I'll say something about this. So yeah. I Got It is a piece I wrote at a, a composing residency in uh, a place called uh, Valparaiso. It was a, a artists in residence program in Spain, in the uh, in near Andalusia. And uh, amazing, you know, amazing place, uh, great opportunity to go there and be, uh, you know, a lot of these artist residencies, uh, they they feed you, they uh, give you a place to live, they give you uh, uh, a studio to work in, they give you a, a piano. So I had all of that. And in, in the, I don't know what it was, two weeks, a month, I forget, it was a while ago. Um, I wrote this one piece, <laughs> one oh short God. piece, because, yeah. you know, you can't like order up creativity, right? So, uh, and I was thinking on this piece, uh, you know, I want to do something with a baseline that is sort of Professor Longhair-ish. And uh, mm. so I came up with this little baseline uh, that I, I think kind of does it. And I, I alternated with a little melodic line that then goes to uh, some space in the melody. Uh, and I also did it, it's based on a blues form which is usually the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord. But instead, I use the one chord, the three chord, and the four chord. Instead of one, four, five, I did one, three, four. Then I throw the five in at the end. So that's what this song is about. I got I it. I noticed you also have it uh, tagged for New Orleans. Is it a New Orleans influence at all? Yeah, well, that's the Professor Longhair part. The Professor Longhair okay. is an influential pianist in New Orleans. And... Okay. Uh, and I, my main project these days, uh, you know, after Bird Songs of the Mesozoic, which was a very different thing, but Revolutionary yeah. Snake Ensemble is my main creative outlet uh, these days, which is very influenced by New Orleans Second Line and Mardi Gras music, uh, along oh. with uh, uh, free improv and funk. So a couple of different uh, areas that we're coming from. So I write music for that band occasionally. And uh, this is one of the pieces I wrote for that band. Great. So this is Got It. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, thank you. this it's really good like finger snapping foot stomping i'm going to try to find a way to listen to this on the way home tonight i got a two-hour ride tonight <laughs> it's going to be All right. great to listen to that's <laughs> awesome so we got so much to cover i mean we're not going to probably be able to listen to a lot of any one of these but i want to make sure that we give a good a good run for things here and so sure. uh, before we get into the stuff that your wife wrote um or, or that your wife introduced you to on sesame street um there's another one here cassandra four what's the yeah. backstory on that well, that was another piece I did for uh, for Bridgman Packer Dance originally. They had a, uh -huh. another project that I eventually uh, did music for, a second project. Um, and it started out being a project based on the myth of Cassandra, who uh, who was uh, cursed with uh, knowing the future, but having no one believe her, uh, which mm. maybe we can all relate to some in some yeah. way. <laughs> Um, right. but, uh, well, we're not so going to get into politics tonight. <laughs> no, no, poli I'm not. No, did I say anything? No. no um, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I wrote a whole bunch of pieces, Cassandra one, two, three, four, five, you know, I, I don't know. I wrote a whole yeah. bunch of pieces and this was Cassandra four. In the end, they decided, you know what? We're not going to do a piece based on Cassandra. We're going to do a, another piece entirely, uh, which was called, uh, now I forget what it was called, but anyway, I wrote music for that. Uh, but uh, but all the Cassandra music got kind of thrown out the window. But uh, I like it. 
and I like a couple of the pieces, Cassandra Four and Cassandra Five. I've done yeah. with with the Snake Ensemble. So this is a recording of the Revolutionary Snake Ensemble performing Cassandra Four. I'm I'm very pleased with this piece. Excellent. I know the label here, Cassandra Five too, but here's Cassandra Four. this i hear like a little bit of an arabian influence in there too or what would you call hmm. that kind of a, uh, yeah maybe maybe almost like a middle eastern influence in there but yeah. um but yeah, anyway, you are, you on Pan, um, are you on pandora uh i think so i'm not sure maybe. yeah i'm gonna, put, yeah, I'm gonna put that on my card tonight and see if i can get that playing that's great yeah. go ahead i'm sorry yeah. i was gonna say you know it, it's interesting i took some lessons for a while uh with the great uh uh charlie Benakis, the late oh yeah great, charlie Benakis. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And Charlie was a, uh, uh, you know, kind of legendary teacher of improvisation. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, you know, there was a, usually a waiting list of two years before you could get lessons with him. Hmm. Uh, so I, I took lessons with him quite, quite, quite a number of years ago. He's passed away since. But um, one of the things that he taught me was uh, in bebop, uh, you know, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie influenced music. There's a lot of focus on uh, chromatic approaches to chord tones. And so he would give you these exercises where for every possible chord type, of which there are, of course, many, major triad, major seventh, sure. dominant seventh, minor seventh, minor major seventh, you know, all these different chord types, you would then practice, and in every key, all 12 keys, you would mm. then practice uh, a half step approach from above to the first note of the chord, to the tonic. Ah, I half step yeah. uh, uh, from above uh, for, to the third, or maybe a half step from above, and then a half step from below to the third, or maybe wow. diatonic from above, and then a half step from below, or maybe two half steps, uh, two notes, from two half steps above to one half step from above to the note. Oh. And all yeah. these combinations, they're like, you know, a huge Thanks, number. Man. Anyway, yeah. and, you know, this would take you you know, five lifetimes to actually do in all 12 <laughs> keys on every chord type. But wow. what I found after working on that is it got inside my head and a lot of the melodies that you hear, for example, in Cassandra 4, yeah. utilize that uh, that uh, methodology of approaching a chord tone yeah. with, from above chromatically or from diatonically, from below or both or a combination. And I, I'm noticing that in my compositions, I do that a lot. Yeah, it's almost subconscious, I imagine now. It's like yeah, part of yeah, the brain so. in your, You know, I, I never met him, but he's a legend. I, everyone I talk to talks about Charlie Benakis. I, I did get to meet his lovely wife uh, a few years ago, the widow, uh -huh. uh, and she's just wonderful too. So yeah, it's great to hear his name again. He just yeah. the legacy he left. Uh, so this next one is uh, for Karen. Now this was your wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought we might play just a little bit of this. Do you want to remark at all? I think it starts out pretty quietly, so maybe I'll kick in about here. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe a little before that, but uh, oh, okay. yeah, so I will tell you that this one and the Cassandra 4 were recorded uh, very um, impactfully, I'll say, at a, uh, a session I had with a bunch of the musicians from the Snake Ensemble, Revolutionary Snake Ensemble, and some New York musicians mm -hmm. in New York. I had a few dates in New York uh, in 2011, uh, in May, um, 
and I had that booked for a long time. And I booked some studio time at uh, the trombonist uh, Josh Roseman's studio in Brooklyn uh, mm -hmm. as part of that weekend. Well, uh, my wife, Karen Aqua, had been on and off uh, dealing with cancer for 10 years at that point. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she had uh, treatments and then she went into remission and uh, mm -hmm. things were good. And we had a lot of good times during that 10 years, a lot of travel. Uh, she w made animated films. We went off uh, to show her animated films in Sweden and Greece. Uh, you know, we had mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff. But at that point, um, uh, I think it was in May. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong about that. I think it was early May. Um, she had a little bit of a, a, a issue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I I'll cancel all these dates. And she said, no, no, you should go. You should go mm -hmm. and do this. I'll be okay. Uh, we had some good friends who were in, in Cambridge to, to help her uh, should she need it. So uh, we went to uh, New York. We did some gigs and we went in the studio. And one of the things we did in the studio was that uh, Cassandra Four. And the, mm -hmm. another thing we did in the studio was this uh, fully improvised piece for Karen. And oh. uh, it was, as I say, fully improvised. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't know what was going to happen. Started out with some percussion and bells and, uh, and it went on. And it really was so uh, emotion-filled, as you can well imagine. Yeah, um, yeah. And all the musicians, I had some great musicians. I had... Uh, uh, Kenny Wallison on uh, percussion and uh, um, a great trombone player. Uh, 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 now I'm not going to remember people's names, but I, I had some uh, amazing musicians, both from New York and uh, from Boston that joined me mm. uh, for this. And they all felt it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so that That's was right. this piece. It's a longish piece, but we'll hear a little bit of it. And I yeah. will say that, uh, you know, sadly, but also... Uh, I don't know. Uh, Karen passed away at the end of May uh, of that mm. same month. So, uh, oh my God! You know, yeah. that's what's uh, what you're hearing. Wow. Maybe bring it up a little, uh, a little forward to that. No, I mean. Okay. That's good. That's good. very cool how sweet of her to say go and do those gigs that's that's wonderful well yeah i mean it was uh i, I imagine that was not easy for her to say to tell you no. the truth but uh and you are a busy guy my god you know I, I should tell the audience i tried to reschedule this because i was going to be in an operating room all afternoon and and we looked at the schedule i said well maybe friday no i got a gig friday uh saturday i got a, two gigs saturday <laughs> like you're, you're just full up with gigs right now you have so much going on so Again, I very much appreciate your spending this evening with us because I know you've got a busy schedule. So, so yeah. thank you for that. So let's talk about some of her stuff now. Is, are these animations that she did? Or I know she was involved in Sesame Street. Uh, and, and yeah. Were, yeah. So there's a couple of them. This one's called um, Animal Kid Alphabet. Well, this is called, this is, um, 
uh, what is this one called? This is called, uh, oh, gee, uh, that's not really the name of it. I, I forget what the name of this oh, one is. Oh, it's not. Okay. Pass, pass Along Alphabet. Uh, oh, well, okay. there is a, there's a little story. So uh, a couple things. So, yeah, Karen uh, had this great thing that she did. She got the opportunity to uh, uh, do animation for Sesame Street. And uh, the, the producer at Sesame Street, uh, and, and she asked me to do the sound, a lot of her soundtracks, mm. which was uh, great. And the producer at Sesame Street, uh, Arlene Sherman, who uh, has passed away, uh, said, you know, don't talk down to the kids in the animation or the music. Do mm. what you do. So I wrote music that would maybe work for adults as well as for kids. And this huh. piece, uh, you know, I remember uh, Karen asked me to write some something for this. And I went into the studio to record it. And she said, no, that, that's, not, that's no good. That's no good. That uh, no, and wow. so uh, uh, we had two days scheduled for recording, and uh, I went home and stayed up till like two in the morning writing a whole new piece. Oh and uh, this is the piece I wrote, and I, I'm very pleased with what happened, with the end end result. It's uh, you know, there's 26 letters, and you can you you can uh, divide that into two groups of 12, which makes two a plus sum. And uh, that's 24. And then you add a couple more for the last two letters. And uh, uh, 12 bars is a 12 bar blues. So, you know, I could make it into a blues. And I recorded it all with saxophone and percussion. Uh, and then I added bass. And by the way, I want to mention that on, uh, on one of those early pieces, we had the great uh, Mike Rivard playing bass. I forget which one. I think it was the uh -huh. uh, Bridgman Packer dance piece. Anyway, this oh. is uh, the Pass Along Alphabet. Okay. And uh, many of our friends were uh, uh we asked them for their kids uh to she she took photos of the kids and then pixelated them so she took many photos that told the kid okay stand still okay now move your arm a little bit up now move your arm a little bit further oh my now, god a little bit wow. further she took all these photos <laughs> and then she animated those so this uh this young woman here is i think my niece uh emma and there's a bunch of people uh uh the kids of many of my musician friends uh jeff wow. robinson's uh kids uh jesse williams kids so how old is emma now uh at least in her late 20s i think yeah oh so this okay. was a while ago yeah here we go <laughs> I just want to say I'm laughing because my wife and I are trying to learn Italian, and this is probably about the level of cognition that we have so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're like kids that are watching this. That's really the level we're at. There so you, you have go. another Sesame Street here too. Yeah, so we'll play that one now. What's the story on this one, Mass? This, this is called the Parade of Numbers. I still do this piece with uh, the Revolutionary Snake Ensemble, uh, and one of the interesting things is, you know, they they, they march across the screen. And some of them take a little longer than others. So I had to take, the, uh, well, there are two interesting things. I had to take the uh, the music and make it last longer. So, so there are bars of five, bars of six, you know, for as yeah. long as it takes them to march across the screen. But also, um, this is a piece where it had to, Sesame Street wanted this to be able to refer to the number of the day. So sometimes the number of day was 13, sometimes it was 14, sometimes it was 18. Wow. So this is, had to be a piece of music that could end anywhere. It could end after any number. Wow. So I had to write a piece. I like these kind of challenges. I had to write a piece that worked in that way. Every number. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is called Mass 1 through the 20. The rate of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> 
Great of numbers, okay. To stop that, it, it's froze. Oh boy, I'm sorry, I'm having a problem here. I can't stop it. Ah. That's all right, you can listen. Sorry, something happened. I just my whole system locked up. Are you still there? Yeah, we're still here. Oh, good. So maybe we could talk uh, for a while 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 that gets uh, restarted. Yeah. By the way, I want to ask, how did you come up with the name of Revolutionary Snake Ensemble? Well, uh, we our first very first gig. I was asked with uh, my friend uh, trumpeter Scott Getchell, a very fine trumpeter, uh, to play for a loft party in Cambridge. And it was a loft party put on by a, a group of women. Uh, I think it was a birthday party for they, the group of women called themselves the Snake Women. So uh -huh. <laughs> uh, Snake Ensemble and Revolutionary, I don't know. It, I, I always tell people that I think I had subconsciously, I was thinking about uh, this very important uh, free jazz group called the Revolutionary Ensemble. And so a uh, revolutionary snake ensemble, but I didn't know it at the time. I just, uh, just kind of came to me, came out of thin air. Yeah. That's where it came from. Excellent. Well, I'm downloading some of the, I'm just uh, setting up the tabs again because I lost everything, unfortunately, but um, oh, well. although maybe I could just go. Check out this uh -oh. oh, man. Michael, yeah. your cousin. Unfortunately now, yeah, I may have to skip ads here. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but the next one was Cassandra 5. Do you want to do that? Uh, sure, we can do Cassandra 5. That's an interesting one. I have some things to say about it. Sure. Uh, so Cassandra 5 was another one of the Cassandra pieces. And um, I'm not sure why, but I decided to write something in in uh, the time signature of 13, 13 beats uh, to the measure. Oh, wow. And mm -hmm. uh, it's divided up as 3, 3, 3, 4. So three threes, which makes 9, and then 4, uh, which makes 13. Mm -hmm. And... What I what I wanted to do was kind of have this combination of Balkan music. There, there are sort of two uh, arms, main arms uh, of popular brass band music, the Balkan and New Orleans. And uh, so I, I wanted to sort of combine them. And uh, I started out with the, the, the three bars of three being more kind of Balkan, I guess. I don't know. And then the bar four at the end, I use a very typical New Orleans bass line. Bump, 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 bump. Yeah. That's kind of a, a clave rhythm that you're playing at just up a chord uh, triad. Yeah. Um, and so the three bars of three kind of get you to that point. And that's the bass line. Uh, uh, so it's bump, 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 bump. So you hear at the end, bump, bump, bump. It gets there in the bar of four. Uh, that's the bass line. And then I wrote these crazy melodies on top. I I don't, you know, I, I play them back. And I'm like, where did this come from? I have no clue. <laughs> where, how did I come up with this? I, it's just nutty. So yeah. uh, I wrote two different alternate melodies. So in this piece, I don't know if we'll get to both of them. I play one melody and then I play the other melody. I could jump ahead at some point maybe to catch both. So just, well, let's see. Like... If we, we'll, we might hear it. It goes pretty by. Goes All by right. pretty rapidly. Let's check this out. This sounds exciting.
That is great. You know, it reminds me a little bit of some Indian music where you have, you know, three beats, then four, then seven. And, you know, they have yeah. the whole different variety. And uh, what I love about your melody line is it crosses over all of that to, yeah. to give you this great, you know, overarching feel that goes beyond just that 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 undercurrent. So you get yeah. this really interesting weaving in and yeah. out, which is quite fun. Uh, one interesting thing uh, for me now is I'm, I'm just now starting to work with an oud player uh, named Wally. I'm sorry, a what player? Oud, O-U-D, oud. Huh. Uh, a uh, sort of a lute-like instrument from the Middle East uh, uh -huh. that I think preceded the, the lute. Uh, uh -huh. His name is uh, Walid Zahari, and he uh, is from Tunisia. And we're doing a duo project. Now, the interesting thing is, and we're, we wanted to do this piece, but uh, the interesting thing is he tunes his oud uh, up, up a half step. Is it up a half step or down a half step? Anyway, a half step away. So that means that I, I have, have to, to learn. With customized car insurance right. and Liberty I, yeah. Hey, be quiet, Liberty Mutual. So that means <laughs> that I have to learn this whole melody a half step off, uh, which I've been working on now for quite a wow. while. <laughs> wow. So that's that. Okay. You know, yeah, I also... Forgive me. Yeah, forgive me. I'm just trying to load up the rest of the tags. And unfortunately, some of the YouTube ones, I'll just do it when we get there. They're going to bring up ads. But yeah, uh, we got about seven or eight to go still. So do you want to talk a little bit about Om on the Range? I just love that name. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Uh, and I'll also mention that those tunes that we heard, the Cassandra tunes, the uh, uh, For Karen, those are all uh, on my the Revolutionary Snake Ensemble CD called Live Snakes. So it was all basically done live, even though that was in the studio. It was a live recording in the studio. Now, what's the best way for them to buy that CD so that you get the most money out of it? Is, is you I, I, I have no idea how I get the most money, but uh, they can. Uh, it's available online. I mean, if you go to yeah. my website, I think there are some links, kenfield.org. Okay. Or go right. to revolu revolutionary snake ensemble .org. I, I don't know about the most money, but I think it's yeah. if you just search for live snakes, okay. revolutionary snake ensemble, you'll find it somehow. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Om on the range. So I, my very first uh, composing residency was at a uh, uh, well, actually, it wasn't a residency. It was uh, Karen had a residency in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, hmm. They they were just for visual arts there, but I. Um, I joined her, and this was one of the reasons I was working part time at my computer job because I, I went over there to uh, be with her while she had a six month residency there, and oh, they wow. let me uh, log in uh, a couple hours a day to do my work uh, using oh my a dial, dial up modem and a, a yeah. Mac uh, SE that they they shipped to me. And anyway, um, pretty advanced, yeah. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. So. Uh, while I was there, I asked if there was a place I could re uh, practice uh, that had good acoustics. And this uh, place you see in the image there, uh, Subterranea cover of that album, was mm. an underground um, uh, structure that had uh, these amaz this amazing acoustic uh, quality and uh, was owned by the person that funded this artist in residence program, Don Anderson. Um, we lost him a couple of years ago, but he... Uh, uh, so I, he said, you could use that while we're off at our home. And he was a wealthy guy, a home in wow. England. And he gave me, a, he said, talk to my groundskeeper and uh, he'll give you the key. So I went in there for uh, a couple of weeks and recorded and had a, rented a, a tape recorder, a multi-track, eight-track uh, tape recorder at the time. This was before you could do all this in a computer. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, some microphones. And I just recorded stuff, uh, layered saxophones with per improvised percussion, uh, Improvised okay. instruments, actually constructed instruments, and uh, is this something? I'm sorry, is this man-made that he did, or is it like historical stuff from the past in the cave? Or this something? Uh, this was something that a, an an artist created. A, a, ah, I forgot okay. the uh, the guy who who did this, but Very he cool. commissioned yeah. this piece of art on nice. his grounds. Uh, so I recorded this whole basically this whole CD. I had uh, Mike Rivard come in and do some stuff afterwards on bass on one or two of the tracks, but this hmm. one I I just. Uh, recorded uh some percussion it was it was pineapple juice cans that i played with my hands uh that i, I recorded several wow. layers of that and then wow. i layered uh and that was kind of fast and then i layered very long saxophone lines i basically my my uh, constraint to myself was play a note as long as you can hold it with one breath and then play another <laughs> note and so it starts that. out with all the same i'm playing the same note over and over g i think concert g on yeah. alto saxophone, and then I diverge. I don't know if we'll get to the point where I diverge into other notes, but at uh, every layer, I did the same thing. I just held the note for as long as I could hold it and then went to another note 
and just did that improvisationally. So this wow. all should I jump about halfway through at some point to get catch some? Yeah, other sure, stuff? sure. Yeah. Okay. So this is Ohm on the Range. Idea those are pineapple cans. <laughs> yeah, pineapple juice cans. I thought, cans. I thought uh, that was just like a very tight bongo or something, but it was a great sound. Yeah, what yeah. With, with one one side, all the the top removed, the bottom removed, whatever. Top yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Yeah, that's where I get my percussion cred. You know, from that track. <laughs> I love it. That's a great track. Yeah. Okay, uh, thoughts unspoken. Uh, again, the same uh, situation. Uh, recording uh -huh. in the in the what's called the hinge. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this is just, I just played one whole time through on saxophone, improvised uh, uh, melodically, and then did, I don't know, three or four, two, three, four, I don't even remember how many, uh, on top of that, and uh, it's all improvised. Mm. Sorry. I wish we could listen to all of these. I want to ask you, sometimes when you come up with a musical thought, is it always before you play the sax, or do sometimes you play it and things just come out? Yeah, I think it's a combination, actually. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would love to be able to say that I hear everything I play before I play it. But uh -huh. that would be that would be a lie. You know, yeah. it, there's, there's a feedback thing that happens. I, I play something uh, just by putting my fingers on the horn. You know, I play a yeah. note. And that that kind of inspires me to uh, play the next note. And you know, I've been playing saxophone long enough to when I change my fingering to another note, I know what it's going to sound like before I do that. So yeah. it's not I'm not just moving my fingers, but um, but there's some amount of serendipity that something happens. Maybe I get something wrong. You know, I, I don't I'm not I didn't mean to play that note, but then I did. So then I I worked yeah. off of that. Uh, I know it's interesting. Sometimes when I compose a piece, my hands just kind of find a melody, yeah. and you know I just let it work, and and it's it's kind of yeah. fascinating to see how you know it's almost like a subconscious thing that's going on. But but well, we have a bunch of stuff to go through. We probably don't have time to do all of this unless you want to go over by ten minutes or so. Which up to well, you. Well, whatever. I'm happy to you know I have yeah. time. But uh, I do want to say one other thing, which is that I did this sure. whole CD at at the uh, in Roswell uh, in the middle of the the desert there. 
in New Mexico. And, uh, you know, I, I was I was able to interest uh, OO Discs, uh, a label that, uh, you know, normally puts out pretty out stuff. Mm. And he liked it uh, and decided to, to release it uh, under that name, Subterranean. It's currently out of print, but you can find copies of it here and there. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I, it may be digitally available. I'm not sure. But uh, then I got, based on that, I got a residency, uh, an, a composing residency at the U-Cross Foundation in uh, Wyoming. And I was going to go out there and I was going to do the same thing. I was going to record, find a place to record with good acoustics and layer saxophones. And uh, one of my co-members of Bird Songs of the Mesozoic, Michael Biarillo, I remember well, he said, you know, you go out there with the same concept, you're going to end up with the same shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, huh, you know, you, you, you got a point there. And so uh, instead... I wrote all of the next CD that I worked on at the uh, residency at U-Cross on piano. And I'm not a piano player. Uh, you know, Eric huh. Lundgren's a piano player. I'm not a piano huh. player. But I used the piano and I composed at the piano uh, at U-Cross. And that was uh, what resulted was my next CD, which is Pictures of Motion. So huh. I don't know if we're going to hear something from there or not. But Is any of that, uh, can you see the screen? Is any of that on here today? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, actually, oh, my. I don't think so. That's okay. Uh, you know, right. it's out there. People want to hear it. They can hear it. What I think yeah. maybe, uh, what are you thinking you're going to play next? Well, I definitely want to end with birds of the Mesozoic, but, uh, bird songs, these, yeah. one, two bird songs. I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, five. These other five pieces, which ones do you want to focus on? Well, let's, uh, I, I actually am not seeing what time. It, oh, it's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's five saxophones in search of meaning. I love that title. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. That was something yeah. I wrote a long time ago. And I actually, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I wrote it on paper or I just did it in the studio. That was for a project, uh, by this, uh, filmmaker named John Adams from England. Oh. And uh, I, I think I recorded it in the studio. I came up with it in the studio, but uh, I like the piece. Well, before we go, I just you mentioned Roswell, New Mexico. Is that the same Roswell of uh, UFO fame, Roswell? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Did you see anything there while you were there? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Five saxophones in search of meaning. admit this begs the question is the meaning at the end should we go to the end and hear what the meaning came, came out to be there's no they're they're searching baby they're searching they're still searching right to the end yeah they're, they're gonna, searching all the time we're still again. searching we're still searching <laughs> yeah nice ending though i just love it okay uh, this next one you call Stream Breakdown or Breakdown Part One? Breakdown Part One, yeah. So uh, this piece is interesting. So this is uh, also from that session. There you see some of the musicians that were yeah. uh, in New York with uh, Alex Asher, trombonist, and uh, uh, I'm just uh, Blake Newman and Danny Heath and Josh Roseman. Uh, I think that's Gary Sabatini there. Some great musicians I was fortunate mm-hmm. to play with. And... Uh, mm-hmm. We recorded a bunch of stuff and some, you know, one or two of the tracks, I'm like, ah, it didn't really work. So what did I do? I took those tracks and I just kind of chopped them up and put them back together. And I took a bass line or I took a drum line and I, I just layered stuff on top of each other. And I just played around with it in the computer, which is fun and not something wow. I typically do. So this is a totally constructed piece. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So. You know, I have to admit, so these backstories are wonderful because I, I love the other piece with the pineapple. 
pineapple cans, but didn't know yeah. they were on pineapple cans, and now I got a whole new appreciation for it. Okay, yeah. breakdown. <clears throat> up everything and making it line up beat wise that must have been a challenge huh well i i worked with a great engineer and andy pinkham who i've worked with for many 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 years on all kinds yeah. of projects and uh you know in pro tools and you can change tempos you can change keys you could transpose mm -hmm. stuff like for that and so you can make stuff fit and uh you know it was a lot of fun uh putting it's amazing I, yeah. I know when i recorded a cd i had some outtakes i wanted to have little bits of stuff cut you know like cut in or whatever and uh yeah. get the terminology for that and he was able to match up the sine wave down to the point where it was just seamless it's just amazing yeah yeah, it done. yeah you, it's, it's incredible yeah how about this next one this is live now it looks like this is a mardi gras yeah. party 2020 so this is just recently not too long ago. yeah this is a piece <laughs> i wrote the skunk is defunct it's actually about an actual uh dead skunk uh it's defunct <laughs> but you know i spelled it defunct because it's funky <laughs> um and this is the Revolutionary Snake Ensemble. This was, uh, we, we've we been doing these Mardi Gras parties. This was at Regatta Bar. They're, they have not reopened since pandemic. Oh, wow. this, was, uh, yeah. this was in March, I think, <laughs> right before everything, or February, I guess, everything shut down. Uh, yeah. And is that right? 2021? Uh, I don't know. Anyway. No, well, that's when you that's, posted it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I but, think it was uh, uh, March of, of 2019. And uh, yeah. we had uh, Amadi uh, Castanel joining us on saxophone. Uh, but otherwise, it's uh, Dave Harris and Jerry Sabatini, me, uh, Amadi, Tom Hall, uh, Blake Newman on bass, and uh, Phil Neighbors is back there oh. on drums. So. I love the Golda May jackets. It's a nice touch. Uh, the, you uh... you, you got to have that, right? <laughs> All right. Here's some of this. I love it. The skunk is defunct.
tell you, Ken, I love those shades on you. It's definitely a cool cat. <laughs> it really <laughs> comes across. Can you even, can, you probably can't see anything though. You have to love music by, by heart. Of course, it's your music, but I imagine it might be hard no, no. to read the. No, no, I can see. I have a light. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I've memorized, you know, I've memorized a lot of stuff, of but some stuff, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, there are a couple of my pieces that are kind of complicated that I haven't memorized. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, these next few are, are, and since my, uh, my system locked up, uh, they're YouTube, and as a result, we're going to see ads no matter what you do, so I apologize in advance. So let me, um, let me first do uh, I've been getting paid a thousand dollars a month, if not more, wow. just from this app on my phone. Well, and hey, I'm going to do that. That's Let's go do that. <laughs> so this is out of sequence. I'm sorry. I wanted to do the other one, but you want to do uh, Just Walk Closer first? Sure. Sure. Why don't you stop it for a second? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Just Walk Closer was a piece I wrote. Actually, I did this. Uh, Eric might remember. Eric Lindgren might remember. And I, I do want to give some credit uh, to Eric Lindgren and Bird Songs of the Mesozoic. I, I learned uh, so much about composition by playing with Bird Songs of the Mesozoic and listening mm. to how Eric wrote music and and. Mm. You know, of course, I can't write music the way Eric can write music, but I uh, I learned a lot. So I just want to say that. But this was done uh, originally for a project that Bird Songs did with a, a vocalist named Oral Moses. It was a project called uh, Extreme Spirituals, um, where Bird Songs played these kind of out crazy backings to very traditional spirituals that Oral yeah. Moses sang. And yeah. uh, I did an arrangement of uh, Just a Closer Walk With Thee. But what I did was I took the melody and I, I deconstructed it. I took each melody note and I reassigned a different length to each note and a different, uh, and then I, you know, so the whole sequence of melody notes took a different amount of time and became a different melody, even though it was the exact same sequence of pitches, uh, but wow, the durations were all different. <laughs> and so nice. Oral, Oral listened to this and he said, what, that's, you know, he's a traditionalist. So he was like, I, that doesn't make any sense at all to me. So we didn't do it for that. You didn't use it for that project, but subsequently I recorded it with Revolutionary Snake Ensemble uh, yeah. with, with some uh, counter lines. And uh, so that's what this is. All right, just walk closer. It has a little intro that uh, just got an ambient intro. I forget how long the intro is. This is still improvised, just so you know. This is not, not the, the written piece. Still kind of very spiritual in the way it moves. This is the piece. Stories. It's just wonderful. It makes you really appreciate what you're doing here. So we got a few more. Let's see. We have, um, and this one I unfortunately erased. Uh, Ruhan. Oh, Ruhan. Yeah. Ruhan. Ruhan. What's yeah. the story on that? 
Well, Ruhain is a piece. Actually, we we did this with with bird songs, but uh, this is a recording with uh, Revolutionary Snake Ensemble, and uh -huh. uh, this was done as a tribute to uh, Billy Ruhain. Mm -hmm. I kind of re respelled his name. Billy Ruhain was a a, a guy who uh, uh, supported music of all forms in Boston for many years. Uh, mm -hmm. He had some resources, and he also uh, uh, had some, uh, frankly, had some mental issues and. Uh, uh, so he was a little bit crazy, and everybody yeah. knew him and knew him and loved him uh, for both his generosity, his yeah. his love for everyone, and his craziness. And okay. uh, so this is a, after he passed away in two thousand nine, I believe. Uh, mm. This was uh, my way of uh, recognizing nice. Billy Wayne. Now my apologies, we might get hit with an ad, so we'll have to just deal with that for a second. I think we can deal. We yeah. might even decide to buy what they're Usually brass fit small chest <laughs> there go. There you go. like this. Who knows? Uh, how do they know I had a small chest? How do they know that? Yeah. They yeah. just didn't know. <laughs> Intro drum solo by Phil Neighbors. Sure, he would love that wherever he is. That's just great. That's great. Yeah, you can so we're I can down just, to... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, not good. I was going to say, yeah, he would be uh, dancing with his uh, overcoat and no shirt. That was uh, a Billy Ruane trademark. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I should try that look. That might be a new look for me here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. So the last one we're going to do tonight, just to wrapping up, and do you want to kind of introduce a little bit? But let me first see if there's an ad on this one too. Bird songs of the Mesozoic, Mesozoic 100 cycles. Maybe we'll be lucky and bad. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. You know, this, uh, yeah. Well, the this was a piece that uh, didn't have a name, and uh, we worked with a turntablist. Uh, uh, with a turntablist. Oh, just uh, maybe. Uh, am I going to remember who it was? But he uh, he had a um, uh, an album with uh, different uh, sine wave but with tones and mm -hmm. one of them was 100 cycles so you'll uh -huh. hear if we get to that point you'll hear him play a little piece that says 100 cycles and so that's the name of the piece but this is a piece i wrote for bird songs and uh michael Bill Biarillo, uh our guitarist and also uh sound designer did a uh, a little backing track uh a, a rhythmic track so that's what this is excellent
There's some of that sine wave stuff in there. That's yeah, just there crazy. it is. Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you, Ken, so much. Um, I could spend all night just listening to this stuff. And in fact, I know when I go home tonight, I'm going to put on Pandora and see if I can pull you up on that because I need some uh, high energy music to keep up awake tonight. <laughs> but um, just let's let's pop it at the floor now. I don't know if there's anyone uh, that wants to ask some questions live. We can also, if anyone put anything in the chat, I guess I don't see much in the chat. So. Uh, any, uh, feel free to open up to the floor now if people want to unmute themselves and ask a few questions before we wrap up. I know it's running a little late, so uh, maybe I will some... mention if I will mention that uh, I, you know I have a bunch of performances. I'm doing a lot of performances out on the Cape. I'm doing this project called the Symphony of Crickets with poet Charles Coe oh. uh, out on the Cape. I'm doing uh, every Saturday night in Provincetown. I have a project called Revolutionary Funk at a place called the Club. Um, but you can get all, if anybody's interested, uh, it's all on, uh, Kenfield.org. I'm also playing tomorrow night, uh, at Magazine Beach in Cambridge. Uh, the Revolutionary Stank Ensemble is playing from seven to eight at Magazine Beach for a uh, full moon night as part of, uh, the Mass Audubon thing that they're doing there. That's awesome. I guess, uh, we've really extended your time quite a bit. You've been very generous. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I just probably ask you a million questions, but I guess the one that I still always love to ask is just how... Where do you find your inspiration? You know, how do you how do you come up with a melody line? Is there anything that you could share with people that are want to be composers that they could that could, they yeah. could think about how to start with an idea and get from there, go to there? Yeah, I you know, I, sometimes I just fool around on the piano. Sometimes I just fool around on the saxophone. Sometimes something comes into my head. Um, uh, you know, it, it really varies. Sometimes nothing comes into my head. Sometimes <laughs> I just sit there and you know nothing. But uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I think, I, like I say, I'm inspired by all the music I've had the opportunity to play uh, yeah. with bird songs, with Eric Lindgren, with other people. Uh, I know I one usually, of my favorite Frank Zappa songs is uh, something of the regalia. It's like that. Peaches, 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 peaches and regalia. Yeah. Peaches and regalia. Yeah, that's a great one. Oh, yeah. we got a question here from Kent, uh, from uh, Eric. He said, so all the harmonies on Subterranean, were they improvised spontaneously or composed? Uh, they were, well, depends on the one that we heard, the track that we heard, the two tracks we heard were both fully improvised. Fully improvised, yeah. yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. You're going to say something else. I think about. Uh... Uh, no, I was just going to say that. Um, uh, you know, things. What was I going to say? I did have something I was going to well, say. Talking about how to get one of the things you said. Sometimes you don't know. You, you don't have any idea. I know yeah. one of the things I do sometimes. I'll take a little couple of measures of a classical piece, and I'll try to wrap a whole other idea around that. So sometimes yeah. I'll just yeah. kind of steal if you will or borrow or, or be inspired by a little bit of another idea but uh, absolutely absolutely yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the pieces i wrote for bird songs is called this way out i stole the baseline from for from we got to get out of this place uh -huh. uh, okay <laughs> and uh started with that but a lot of times i'll start with a baseline i'll come up with some baseline um yeah. a lot of these days when i write for snake ensemble uh i'm writing basically a melody line a baseline and chords and yeah. my sensibility in terms of harmonic structures is very simple. I, I minimize my chordal uh, content pretty, pretty significantly. So I might just have a single chord like on the Skunk is Defunct. It was mostly just a G vamp, but yeah. I'll, I'll write a bass line and then I'll write a melody line and that's counterpoint. You know, the bass mm -hmm. line and the melody sure. are just counterpoint together. And yeah. that's uh, a lot of what I, what I noticed a long time ago is that all these tunes that you love, it's the bass line, you know, uh, uh, My Girl, you know, it's the bass line. Yeah. All, a lot of those tunes, it's all about right. the bass line. So exactly. writing a bass line first, coming up with something interesting on bass and then adding a melody to it, that's something that happens sometimes. Now, did you say you've done some things for film or... Or something like that. Some other media. I think you. Well, I everything. did the the work for for my for my late wife for Karen. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. She made a uh, uh, has a whole uh, um, series of you know about thirteen independent animated films that she made. So I did a lot of yeah. work for her. Were they all kid related, or were some animations? No, no, that were, no. Yeah. They were not not kid related. Very cool. Is there a place we could see those by any chance? Do you know? She well, yes. Uh, her work is on Vimeo. It's on uh, Vimeo on demand. You have to uh -huh. pay a small amount to stream them. But if you go okay. to Karen Aqua, search for Karen Aqua and Vimeo, you'll you'll have access yeah. to yeah. her films on Vimeo. She also has a website. I put together uh, KarenAqua.com. Oh, nice. So, well, Ken, thank you so much for your time. Eric, thank you for introducing me to Ken because this has been a great two weeks for me listening to his music and just loving it. And uh, this culmination of all that 
effort and prep and and really appreciate your time ken and helping get this done and and yeah. I'm glad it all came together, even though I'm at work here. You can see the back on this patents on things they, they worked on here. And, and I, I was yeah, sure it looks like you looks like you won a lot of awards back there. I won a lot of awards, yeah. None of them are mine, but <laughs> I'll take yeah, credit I where I can. Thank you very much, Eric, for uh for said it for introducing me to Andrew and to Hillary. I, I just want to give a little shout out to uh, to to CJ who's here. And uh I don't know if I recognize other names, but uh uh, thanks so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. It's our pleasure. Thank you to the Cummings Foundation. Thank you to the Jenks Center. Thanks to my lovely wife who put this all together. And I hope to see you all again next month when I interview a, a fellow named Rich Shakala, who has done some very interesting music that's on, uh, uh, it's been on General Hospital and, and Dance With Me and things like that. So uh, I think that'll be a very interesting show. And uh, hope you all see you again. Thanks a lot. Have a great night. And please listen to Ken's music. It's awesome. Enjoy it. Thank you, Ken, for all you do. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.